Welcome to Artists and Perspectives, a production of Valdosta State University featuring the views and performances of faculty artists. Today's guests are Dr. Lawrence Scully and Dr. David Johnson. All musicians gravitate to a certain musical instrument or the voice or whatever. Uh, the piano is my chosen instrument, um, probably because I feel that it's the one that expresses most of what I have to say. I have had opportunities to play other instruments, which I did, but um, the piano is the one that I have gravitated to. I think the, the instrument itself offers the most possibilities for me to make music. But to me, when I have to counsel young people about what is the future, where can I be successful, you know, you want to do something that you feel good at doing. And um, after you've done that, you want to feel like, yes, I've accomplished that, and I feel like this is something I'm positively doing well. When you have that feeling, it doesn't happen all the time, of course, but when you have that feeling, then you know you're being successful at the, at the thing you're doing. And um, in the training of young musicians, I try to help develop within them what that success means. Um, so a student might come in with a piece they've prepared and play it roughly like this. <laughs> Understanding the notes, and the rhythm and so forth. But to really truly be successful, you want to have a sense of understanding of the music. So I have to help them with the interpretation of it. We talk about a phrase. We talk about ornaments. We experiment with this in the lesson for a while. And then they try it again, and they see if they can incorporate all these things. And then it's like a good argument or a good conversation. The student begins to feel successful about the interpretation of the phrase and the ornamentation. And this, over a period of time, develops, develops a sense of uh, Success. Now turn to the fugue. Turn to the fugue. This is a three voice fugue. Now I realize you've just started to look at the piece, but can you identify the three voices for me? Can you play, for instance, what, what voice starts it? Okay, that's the alto, isn't it? Okay. Can you play just the alto part for me, just the way exactly you'd like to play it? if we could play it a little bit more dramatic, this way. Okay. If they want to achieve and be, for instance, a concert pianist, or if they want to be a college professor, or if they want to be, just be a piano teacher, you have to be good at playing the piano. You have to put in hours of hard work. You have to practice. You have to be self-centered. You don't study the piano as a group therapy session. You prepare all on your own. It's a little bit lonesome. You put in long hours late at night. Uh, you travel long, uh, long distances to compete in competition. Um, you're in competition with all of your peers all the time. You have to have kind of a hard skin 
but yet you have to have feelings and you have to be uh, not afraid to show those feelings in the music because if they don't come through no one will want to listen to you <laughs> is Carl Muirling. Uh, actually, it was in Virginia, Radford University. <clears throat> Carl is a foreign student studying here. He's from Sweden. Uh, he's on a Rotary Club scholarship. They're sponsoring him this year uh, at Valdosta State. A very gifted young musician. He's 20 years old. Um, and of course, he's had a wonderful training back in Sweden. And he's been studying with me all year, and he decided to enter the international Bartok Kabalevsky competition which um, has a big cash prize and is very prestigious. And um, the competition itself uh, was grueling. He uh, played a work by Bartok and a work by Kabalevsky and was chosen as one of the three finalists in the college division and placed second place. <laughs> problems with the Moonlight Sonata <clears throat> is that Beethoven says in the score, it should, I won't read it in Italian, but in English it means the whole piece should be very, very soft and it should be played with the pedal depressed throughout the piece. Now any of you that play the piano know that if you depress the pedal, you get a blur and of course, if he says to hold the pedal down for the whole piece, this is kind of a dilemma. How do you make it work? So you want to give this kind of silvery effect throughout. And of course, you want to use the soft pedal, because he says to use the soft pedal throughout, too. So one of the tricks we do is we depress some of the notes at the bottom of the piano, so their dampers are off the strings. We push with our foot both the middle pedal and the soft pedal. So those dampers are up in the air, the strings are ringing, and then I can still pedal with my other foot, and it stays soft. And it gives the effect that Beethoven had in mind. You see, Beethoven's piano, when you push the soft pedal, the hammer only hit one string. On the modern piano, there are three strings per note. In the modern pedal, the hammer hits two of those strings, not just one. So our modern piano doesn't get as soft as Beethoven's. So anyway, it's a real dilemma to try to make the Moonlight Sonata sound as soft and as pedaled as Beethoven intends. But I try to do that through that little gimmick that I just showed you. I learned that years ago from Rudolf Serkin, the famous Beethoven expert.
The other problem with the moonlight is that <clears throat> you have this beautiful melody which goes nowhere, just sits there, and all this stuff, which appears to be important, but of course is just biding time, and you really want to hear the beautiful melody, so we pianists have this problem, we call it voicing. You want like the soprano to be heard louder than the altos, so you have to uh, adjust your hand to do it, and it's very difficult to do. I'll do it wrong once, and you'll see what I mean. are much too loud. So what I have to do is adjust my fingers and strike the top note a little harder. And it's not so easy, but I'll see if I can do it. the melody that you want to hear. So even though the Moonlight Sonata sounds very simple, it should sound simple, but it's very complicated to put all that stuff together and keep it all very soft and hold your foot down the pedal, like Beethoven says. It's a really uh, a dilemma of a piece to play.
have opportunities to do various kinds of performances and sing uh, various kinds of music. For instance, this May, I will have the uh, uh, privilege and the opportunity to uh, premiere uh, a work by a Polish composer, uh, Szymanowski. A friend of mine has redone uh, one of his choral compositions, and this will maybe be the first performance uh, in, I know in South Georgia, maybe even uh, in the Southeast. That's a, that's a rare opportunity to be able to do something like that. Plus, I get to do other, other performances for uh, you know, various numbers and kinds of individuals. Uh, so I enjoy, I enjoy that aspect of being a performer, being able to sing different styles, different kinds of music, different levels of music for different levels of people. Uh, that's, that's, that's real special to me. I guess being a classical artist would, would mean that uh, you have to devote your, basically your whole life to that. Uh, I think I have the best of two worlds. Uh, I still sing. I have wonderful choral ensembles that I conduct here. And I'm a teacher. And those three things combined together give a great deal of satisfaction. I guess in, in the technical term, I am not a, a, a classical artist, uh, meaning that I devote, that's all that I do. Uh, there are other things that I do, and I have the utmost respect for those individuals who do that. And I have a number of friends in New York and Chicago that do that on a daily basis. Uh, I get to do three things where they get to do maybe just one thing um, all the time and I enjoy all of the areas of which I'm involved. studying piano when I was five and carried that on through elementary school and high school, uh, adding uh, organ my senior year. I played in the band and uh, was exposed to a, a lot of different kinds of music and then on into college, uh, had the opportunity to sing and, and play in some really fine groups that helped me develop my individual skills. I had good teachers that also uh, gave me the time and uh, the, uh, uh, their knowledge, which also uh, helped me to kind of hone my skills.
the voice is an instrument. Uh, it's uh, one that we carry around with us with all the time, and uh, it's something that we, we can't get rid of because it's inside of us. Uh, when we get sick, our instrument doesn't perform very well, whereas maybe a pianist, if he was ill, he could go ahead and, and play, but if we have something that's wrong with the, with the throat, with the chords, then we don't perform very well. So as singers, we have to learn how to uh, take care of ourselves and keep ourselves in decent shape so that uh, once we need the voice, that we can call on it and it, and it responds when, when we need it. Mors stupevit. Mors stupevit ed natura Cum resurget creatura Judicant well, I guess in many instances you would you would define success on uh, whether or not you make it to the Metropolitan Opera, or uh, whether or not you uh, uh, get a receive a doctorate in vocal performance from some major university. Uh, I guess I guess it's all relative. Uh, I feel like that I'm 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 successful. I've had good students that have gone on and and uh, progressed in in their in their area. Uh, I am still able to perform myself and uh, to uh, to show my students through my performing what I talk about in my lessons. And uh, I have some of them that come to rehearsals and. And they, and they watch what I do, and then they say, well, yeah, I understand now what you're talking about. Well, for some reason, I think that wasn't the right pitch. Come down and start this one. I guess that was right. I guess the silence just takes away. Do this one one more time. Okay. I can, I can think of a student that I have in my studio now who came in this year as a freshman. Uh, he did come during his senior year in high school and studied with me once a week for a 30-minute lesson. And I think when he, he, when he first came, of course, it was, it's a natural voice. It's just a, it's, it's just a voice that he just has. And uh, it's a marvelous, beautiful, free instrument. And what we do now as he is beginning to mature and uh, beginning to understand more about his instrument is that we are tr trying to identify problems that he might have vocally, which w it may be breath, it may be vowel structure, it may be uh, uh, some other things that that he might have that we need to uh, uh, make some corrective uh, uh, exercises. And that's what we do. We start with the exercises to try to improve his ability to sing fast scales or to sing higher notes. And we, we try then to develop those exercises into the literature so that there is some kind of uh, 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 crossover between the exercises and and singing the literature. It's just like a football player. 
I mean, they go and, uh, to their practice times in the afternoon, and they run these various plays, and they know exactly where they're supposed to be at what point. Then when they get into the game, then they know exactly what it was because they've rehearsed it. They have variables, too. Just like uh, I was talking a minute ago, sometimes you don't know that the the defense will will bring in a uh, a defense that you haven't seen, and that's a variable that you just can't control, or somebody falling down, you know, or lots of those kinds of things. But we try to make it make it cross over from the practice time, the voice lesson, to the actual performance on the stage. I guess I get the most satisfaction from being a teacher by seeing my students excel at their own, at their own pace, uh, seeing them understand things that I talk about, being able to uh, distinguish good and bad, being able to be uh, more ob objective about their singing, about their performance, uh, and then seeing those students leave Valdosta State and go out on their own and be successful teachers or performers or both. Vocalists and choral people are a little bit different than pianists and, and, and orchestral players because we have, we have a text that we have to deal with. Now, believe me, the, the, the pianist and the orchestral players and other players do get into the, the emotion of the music, but we have to deal with words. And the words to us, the text to us, becomes sometimes uh, less important and it should be more important that we have the emotion of the word for instance the word if you were singing in a uh, you were singing a german art song and you sing, you were singing the word uh, you were singing the word tote which means death there would be a certain emotion that one would try to establish with that word in that phrase so uh, yes we do have to, uh, to to deal with the text especially I think one of the most uh, significant things of the Verdi Requiem is that it's uh, it's so operatic and uh, and gives a lot of um, a lot of attention to the uh, to the chorus, not only to the to the soloist but to the chorus. And one of the most one of the most wonderful places in the uh, in the Requiem is the the Dies Irae. Day of Wrath.
it's so operatic and the, the orchestra is so uh, is so heavy and and uh, it seems like it's so full of life but yet it's the sounding of of death with these huge chords and then they, the chorus comes in with D es ire, D es ire. it goes on for with, with the sopranos and everybody singing Wonderful, uh, it's a wonderful work that's that's more, I think, more operatic than it is uh, than anything else, and one that that we have done at Valdosta State with uh, with the Valdosta Symphony Orchestra. Oh.